I now move on to the third unit in the second major part of the course, the contents of the universe. In the next dozen lectures or so, I'll be discussing stars, their births, their lives, their deaths, what happens to them, how do they pr produce the elements of the universe, what kind of compact and weird remains come about when stars die. Lots of really interesting stuff about the fundamental properties of the stars you see in the sky. Specifically, in the next four lectures, I'll start by describing some of the properties of stars, their distances, surface temperatures, and compositions. I'll then move on and discuss their sizes and how we determine them, and also their apparent and intrinsic brightnesses, their luminosity, their power. And finally, I'll turn to mass, which turns out to be the key to everything else, at least for the main part of the, of the lives of stars during the course of their evolution. It turns out that what they do and how they behave depends almost entirely on their mass. Now, stars are simply distant versions of our sun. Our sun is a huge, glowing, opaque ball of gas gravitationally held together. It's enormously massive, 330,000 times as massive as the Earth, and it's held together by gravity, and there are nuclear reactions going on deep in the core, providing the light that we see. And the stars are simply just suns, but very, very far away, so they look very faint to us. There's a seemingly countless number of them as you look along the Milky Way. You look at the dark night sky, far from city lights, when the moon is down, and you just see all these stars, especially when you look through binoculars or a telescope. But the number of stars is, in fact, finite, and you can go about counting them in certain ways. If you're really bored, just go around one, two, three, four, five. There are more efficient ways of counting them. And it turns out that astronomers have figured out that a big galaxy like our own, which might look something like the one shown here, has something like 300 to 400 billion stars. Now, we don't know that number very accurately, but that's roughly how many stars there are in a big galaxy such as our own. A few hundred billion. And as I've said before, there are billions of galaxies to be seen in the universe. Well, despite the very large number of stars in a galaxy, the distances between stars are vast. The galaxy is huge. So traveling from star to star would be very challenging, as we saw in the previous lecture on interstellar travel. To do it quickly in your own frame of reference, your speed would have to be pretty close to that of light. And the amount of energy required to get you up to that enormous speed would be almost unfathomable. Moreover, let me emphasize that to get up to such high speeds, you need to gently accelerate. If you go zooming from rest up to 99% of the speed of light in a few seconds, your bones and your flesh will be crushed by the acceleration. You would be surely killed. So you need to accelerate up to these enormous speeds rather gently at one or two times the acceleration normally felt here on the surface of the Earth. Maybe for a while you could sustain accelerations of five times that at the surface of the Earth, but your bones and your flesh don't like that, you know, so just a few Gs would be better. And so it would take you some time to get up to such speeds, and only then would you begin to gain from the benefits of having your clock move slowly or run slowly relative to the people back on Earth. So, you know, interstellar travel is possible in a short time, but very difficult to achieve because of the problem with slow accelerations and then slow decelerations when you get to your destination, and the even bigger problem of having to get a huge amount of energy to, to propel you up to those speeds in the first place. So, you know, I don't know that we'll ever get to the other stars. Maybe we will someday if our technology becomes sufficiently advanced, but certainly not within my lifetime. Well, you might ask, well, how do we really know that the stars are at such vast distances? Maybe they're just a stone's throw away. And how do we know that they're at different distances? After all, in Lecture 7, I had said that the stars appear to be glued or attached to a celestial sphere, all at apparently the same distance, and that distance, for all we can tell, 
is infinite, at least compared to the relatively puny size of the Earth. You know, no matter where you go on Earth, the pattern of stars seems to be the same, and that suggests that all of them are very, very far away, because if some were very nearby and others were far away, as you change your position on Earth, the relative patterns of stars would change. And the ancient Greeks knew that that's not the case, so even they figured out that the stars are very far away, maybe infinitely far away. So how do we get the distances of stars? Well, it turns out that some stars are more nearby than others, and you can determine the distances of the nearby stars by looking at how their apparent position shifts relative to the background stars as Earth orbits the Sun over the course of the year. Let me show you an example of what surveyors do on the surface of the Earth to, to get distances. If you want to get the distance of a tree, you can measure its apparent position relative to more distant background objects as viewed from one location of the Earth, and then go to another location and measure again the position of the tree relative to more background, more distant trees. There will be an angle, a shift of the nearby tree relative to the distant backdrop of trees. You can measure that angle. Here it is right here. And you also presumably know your baseline, that is the distance between the two positions from which you measured the location of the tree. Knowing that baseline and the angle by which the tree shifted, you can determine the distance to the tree, that is the length of this dotted line right here. It's a unique triangle that you've determined. So this is what we call triangulation, or surveyors call it triangulation, and we effectively use triangulation when we determine the distances of nearby stars relative to more distant stars. So here's a nearby star. I look at it first with one eye open, the right eye open, and it looks like it's aligned with over there, Betty, and then I look at it with my left eye and it looks like it's aligned with Sam. And there's an angle between Betty and Sam, and I can measure that angle and I know the distance between my eyes, and in such a way I can figure out the distance of my finger from my eyes, all right? Now, in the case of stars and the Earth, what you do is wait for the Earth to traverse half its orbit around the Sun and view the position of the nearby star relative to the backdrop of the very distant stars from these two positions of the Earth in its orbit separated by six months or so. So here's the Earth in January and you're looking at this nearby star relative to the more distant apparently fixed stars and in January, it looked like the nearby star was between stars 1 and 2 in this distant backdrop. Whereas six months later in July, that same nearby star looked projected against stars 4 and 5. See, it's just between stars 4 and 5 here. So it shifted from between stars 1 and 2 to between stars 4 and 5 over the course of the six-month interval between your times of observation from here on Earth. And this angle by which it shifted in the sky is known as twice the parallax. We call it twice the parallax by convention simply so that the parallax itself, that is one times p, would have been the angle of shift had you observed the star in January and then, say, three months later in April instead of six months later in July. So in going through the full baseline of the Earth's orbital diameter, you get a shift which by convention we call twice the parallax. Had you only gone for a baseline of 1 AU, that is the radius of the Earth's orbit around the Sun, then you would have gotten a shift half that amount or simply the parallax P. So let's look here at this animation which shows a star that's pretty nearby shifting back and forth relative to the more distant stars as the Earth orbits the Sun. In this case, the star is in the plane 
of Earth's orbit around the Sun, so the motion is simply a straight line back and forth. Had the star been perpendicular to the plane of the Earth's orbit around the Sun, then the shift will, would have been a little circle in the sky, because if we're orbiting the Sun like this and we're looking at a nearby star, its angular shift will go over a circle in the sky rather than a line segment as you get if you're looking along the orbital plane of the, of the Earth around the Sun. So that's the parallax shift. And you can see from this diagram and also from the finger blinking exercise that as the distance of a star increases, the parallax decreases. Now, I'm not saying that a given star is moving away from us, but let's look at three different stars here, A, B, and C at three different distances from the Sun. The parallax of A, that is the angle subtended or covered by one astronomical unit as seen from star A, is bigger than that angle, the parallax, as seen from star B, which is more distant than star A. And star C is even more distant than B and A, and so one astronomical unit covers or subtends an even smaller angle as seen from star C. Now, the angle subtended by one AU, as seen from most stars, is really small. It's typically smaller than one second of arc. Now, let me remind you that there are 60 seconds of arc in a minute of arc, and there are 60 minutes in a degree, and there are 360 degrees in a full circle, or 90 degrees from the horizon to the zenith. So one second of arc is very small indeed. It's roughly the size of a dime seen from about four kilometers distance, okay? So it's very small. And, and basically all stars have parallax shifts that are smaller than one arc second. So it's a very small amount. And you can see in this diagram then that I've greatly exaggerated the angle subtended by one AU as seen from a star. This, this should be about one arc second or less and uh, in fact, it looks way bigger in this diagram, but you know, I drew it big so that you could see that the angle is non-zero. Now, in this particular case, I've drawn an angular shift of exactly one arc second. You get an angular shift of one arc second if the star is at a distance of what's called one parsec. A parsec is a parallax of one arc second parsec. So if a star were at a distance of one parsec, the angular shift, or the angle subtended by one astronomical unit, would be one arc second. Now you might wonder why do we make this definition. Turns out that the distances of stars are very easy to compute in parsecs if you know their angular shift in arc seconds. Now again, the parsec is a very large distance. It turns out to be about three and a quarter light years, or 206,265 astronomical units. So this, this line here should have been 200,000 times longer than that line there. That's why I couldn't show it uh, to scale in this diagram. But in any case, one parsec corresponds to a distance at which the parallax is one arc second. With this definition of parsec, the distances of stars become easy to compute. The distance of a star in parsecs is simply the reciprocal or inverse of its parallax in arc seconds. Let's look at the formula. The distance in parsecs is one over the parallax in arc seconds. So suppose you measure the parallax P of a bunch of stars. The first one has a parallax of half an arc second. You invert half an arc second, you get the number two. That means the distance of the star is two parsecs, about six and a half light years. For a parallax of a tenth of an arc second, you invert that, you get a distance of 10 parsecs, or 32.6 light years. For a parallax of a hundredth of an arc second, the reciprocal of that is 100, and so that would be the distance of the star, 100 parsecs. All right? So the reciprocal of the parallax in arc seconds is simply the distance of the star in parsecs. Very simple with that definition bit of an arcane definition of distance, you might think, you know, parsec. Why not just use light years? Well, it turns out the formula is more complicated if you li use light years. You know, you have to multiply by a factor of 3.26. So astronomers simply use the distance measure parsecs, though we know that it corresponds to about three and a quarter light years.
Now, Alpha Centauri, the nearest star that we know of, here it is in the Southern Hemisphere, has a parallax of 0.77 arc seconds. And so its distance is the reciprocal of that, or 1.3 parsecs, then multiply by 3.26 and you get 4.2 light years as the distance of the nearest star. And all the others have bigger distances, so their parallaxes are even smaller than 0.77 of an arc second. Now, the typical stars that you can see that are nearby are perhaps 30 to 300 light years away. That means 10 to 100 parsecs. So their parallaxes are a tenth to one one hundredth of an arc second. But as we will see later, some of the brightest stars in the sky that you see are much, much farther away. You see them only because they're really intrinsically very powerful stars, and so you can see them very far away. But the nearest stars that you could see through a telescope or with the naked eye are of order, you know, 30 to 300 light years away, or 10 to 100 parsecs. Okay, well, this method works only because there's a very distant set of stars that shifts very little as the Earth orbits the Sun. So it's the nearby ones that shift a lot relative to the distant ones that shift very little. And these shifts are very difficult to measure. In a photograph taken from the ground, you know, you've got blurring caused by the atmosphere and stuff. The images are fuzzed out. It's hard to measure accurately the shift of a star that's shifting by less than about one one hundredth of an arc second. That's really hard to measure. So that means that the most distant stars that we can measure from the ground have distances of about a hundred parsecs. And those aren't even very accurate distances. You can accurately measure the shift of a star if its parallax is a tenth of an arc second. That means its distance is 10 parsecs. So we know accurately the distances of stars within 10 or 20 or 30 parsecs, and less accurately the distances of stars up to about 100 parsecs. To get even more distant stars, you need to use a satellite. And in fact, in 1989, the European Space Agency launched a satellite called Hipparchos after the great Greek astronomer, and it made a catalog of about 120,000 stars out to 100 parsecs in distance, 300 light years, and it got very much more accurate distances for those stars than we can do from here on the ground. And it got less accurate distances for another set of a million stars farther away than 100 parsecs because it was able to measure even smaller shifts than one one hundredth of an arc second. And so it could get these more distant stars, although with, with less accuracy. But in any case, this was a great catalog and it improved our knowledge of the distances of stars immensely. Now, the distances of even more distant stars have to be determined in other ways. And in a few lectures, after I develop more material, I'll show you how we determine the distances of stars that are too far away for this direct trigonometric parallax or triangulation method that I've been talking about. Distances of stars are, are important to astronomers and people in other walks of life sometimes recognize this. I'm amused that the poet Edwin Arlington Robinson apparently knew of the importance of the distances of stars and the method of triangulation that astronomers used because in octaves 11, he refers to stars whose distances have not been measured. Here's part of the poem. And thus we die, still searching, like poor old astronomers who totter off to bed and go to sleep to dream of untriangulated stars. So there you go. He's, he's referring to stars whose distances astronomers have not yet measured through triangulation. Now let me... Now let me move on to the surface temperatures of stars. As discussed in lecture 21, stars in the sky have different colors, and you can see this especially if you take photographs of them. You can see here that some are orange, some are blue, some are white. But even in this photograph, the colors are a bit indistinct. You can see the colors better if you allow the, the, the camera to trace the star trails as the Earth rotates. So in other words, instead of having the camera fixed at a particular star during the course of the exposure, 
in a guided sort of way. Just let it stare off into space and let the Earth's rotation make it point to different parts of the sky and you will see the stars trail along the photograph as I described early in this course. And in such a way you can see the, the colors better because there's more light to register. You can, you can see the differences better. Now, as I discussed before, the hotter stars are the bluish ones and the cool stars are the reddish ones and the stars that have medium temperatures appear white. Now, we discussed in lecture 21 the curves emitted by hot objects that are glowing on their own, that are glowing because of the thermal or heat motions, the random motions of particles within them. And it causes them to glow. And when they glow in this way, they produce these curves, which we called Planck curves. And strictly speaking, these curves apply in their precise mathematical form only to objects that are perfect absorbers and emitters of radiation, objects that are known as black bodies. So let's suppose you have an object that doesn't reflect any radiation and doesn't transmit any radiation, it, it's not transparent, it only absorbs radiation, okay, and the radiation causes it to heat up. And it might produce radiation on its own internally, like stars have nuclear reactions that produce energy, so that's okay as well. So you can absorb energy or you can produce it internally, but you don't reflect any energy and you don't transmit through yourself any energy. You don't, you're not transparent to light coming in from the outside. Such an object is one of these ideal radiators. It is a perfect absorber and it turns out to be a perfect emitter as well because it absorbs this radiation and it might generate some on its own if it's a star and the atoms and things jiggle around and that jiggling motion depends only on the temperature of the object and that allows the object to emit a very precisely defined mathematical form for the spectrum of emitted light and that is the spectrum of, of a black body. Now, the stars are roughly black bodies. They do have some absorption lines, as I'll discuss more today, but they're pretty much black bodies, and in that case, the approximation of these mathematical curves to the spectrum of a star is a pretty good approximation. And as we discussed in Lecture 21, the hotter the star, the more to the blue is the peak of its spectrum. So cool stars have a peak in the red or infrared parts of the spectrum. Hot stars have a peak in the green or blue or even violet part of the spectrum. And we describe this mathematically through Wien's law, which says that the wavelength of the peak of the spectrum multiplied by the surface temperature of the star, the temperature of its photosphere, is a constant. It's about 2.9 times 10 to the 7 in units of angstrom kelvins. Okay, so if you measure the peak of the spectrum of a star and you see at what wavelength that appears, you can calculate the surface temperature of the star. That's how we get surface temperatures. And when you plot out the surface temperatures of stars in a table like this, you find that some are very, very hot, over 28,000 degrees, and those are known as the O-type stars. Some are somewhat less hot, 11 to 28,000 degrees, and those are the B stars. Cooler still are the A stars, and then the F stars, and then the G stars, whose temperatures are between 5 and 6,000 degrees. Our sun, having a temperature of 5,800 degrees, is what's called a G2 star. From hottest to coolest, stellar subtypes go from 0 to 9. So G2 is a bit hotter than G3, for example. And then there are the even cooler stars, the K stars, and the M stars, whose temperatures are from 2200 degrees to 3800 degrees. And in the last decade or so, an even more cool class has been recognized, the so-called L stars, and they have temperatures lower than about 2200 degrees. So the hot stars appear bluish, the cool stars appear reddish, and the ones in between, the mid-range stars, are, are, appear white in the sky. Now, you might say this is kind of a weird sequence of letters to remember. How can you remember this thing? I'm not usually into remembering fine details like this unless you really need to know them. But this one happens to be particularly easy to remember. You could say, oh, be a fine girl, kiss me lovingly. Or, oh, be a fine guy, kiss me lovingly, depending on your preferences. 
So that's an easy way to remember the spectral sequence of stars. Some of my students have a different way of remembering it. They say, oh boy, Alex Filipenko gives killer midterms laughing. So that's a good way to remember it perhaps as well. I give pretty tough exams. And over the years, people have thought up many, many mnemonics. I invite you to think of a mnemonic for the spectral sequences. So why do we have this strange lettering scheme? It turns out that it has to do with the absorption lines in spectra. The stars are not perfect black bodies. Their spectra do depend a little bit on the chemical composition, not just on the temperature. So as I discussed before, the inner parts of a star emit a featureless continuum, but the outermost parts are cooler, and some of the atoms are neutral or singly ionized or doubly ionized. That is, they've retained some of their electrons, and those electrons can jump from one level to another when they absorb photons, and that produces these absorption lines. So there's the spectrum of a star with absorption lines. Now, if you look at the spectra of many stars, you'll see that they have different absorption lines at different strengths. Here is an O-type star that doesn't have much hydrogen. It has some helium lines down here and weak hydrogen. Then there's the A-type stars that have strong hydrogen. And the B-type stars have sort of intermediate strength hydrogen. And then you go down to the F and G and K stars and you see the hydrogen weakening, but other lines appear. Here's a line of sodium. Here's a line of calcium down here. There's a bunch of lines of iron. And in the, and, and in the coolest stars, the M stars and L stars, you start seeing bands that are due to molecules like titanium oxide. So the spectra of stars look different depending on the surface temperature. And it turns out that Annie Jump Cannon, pictured here with another famous astronomer in the early 20th century, Henrietta Leavitt, classified the spectra of about 225,000 stars according to the strength of their absorption lines. And she knew that the absorption lines are produced by atoms, but she didn't know exactly what was the physical cause of the different strengths. So she just simply said, let the ones with the strongest hydrogen lines be the A-type stars. And weaker hydrogen lines, those would be the B-type stars. And when other lines start appearing, there were other letters associated with those stars, okay? And some of the letters were skipped. So it turned out there was O, B, A, F, G, K, M, L, as we now know. And later when it was realized that this is really a sequence in surface temperature, well then the, the letters became jumbled up. In other words, the, the A stars are the ones with the strongest hydrogen lines, but they're not the very beginning of the sequence, okay? They, they're sort of in the middle. They're mid-temperature stars, those that have strong hydrogen lines. So the sequence got jumbled up because its origin with Annie Jump Cannon preceded a physical understanding of what produces the lines with different strengths in different stars. And it turns out that it's the temperature that's the really important factor. At very high temperatures, hydrogen gets ionized. It doesn't have a bound electron anymore. And so it can't produce absorption lines. So that's why the O-type stars don't show hydrogen, okay? Very cool stars, conversely, have all of the hydrogen with their electron in the lowest possible energy level, and absorption of photons from the lowest energy level occurs in the ultraviolet part of the spectrum, not the visible part of the spectrum. So again, you don't get visible hydrogen lines in the cool stars, but for a different reason than you don't get visible hydrogen lines in the hot stars. And all the other elements and all the other lines can be explained in a similar way. They are an effect of temperature primarily. And in this plot of relative strength of lines of different elements versus spectral type, you can see that the spectra of stars having different surface temperatures are dominated by different lines. For example, ionized helium for O-type stars and molecules for M-type stars. Now beyond that, for a given temperature, two different stars will have different strengths of lines depending on the abundance, the amount of each element in the star. And you can see this 
in this little simulation where we can turn on, for example, carbon and calcium and oxygen in a star, and you can see the absorption lines. But if you decrease the amount of carbon and calcium and oxygen, you can see that the absorption lines get weaker. So the most important effect that dictates the strength of absorption lines is the temperature of the star. But for a given temperature, two stars will have different strengths of absorption lines depending on the chemical composition. And it is through the analysis of the spectra of many, many stars that we can tell what their chemical composition is. And astronomers have determined that over 98% of the mass of typical stars consists of hydrogen and helium, elements that were produced early in the universe, at the time of the Big Bang, or shortly thereafter. All the other heavier elements, as we will see, will pr were produced by previous generations of stars preceding the star that we are currently analyzing. And those previous generations of stars exploded and mixed together and new stars formed and we see those heavy elements as the debris from long dead stars.